Lift off of Mission 41B, the first flight of the orbiter Discovery, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Welcome home, Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'll have to take it up the hangar, Joe. We're going to dust it off first. Three, two, one, zero, zero, zero. and liftoff. Liftoff. Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of The Earth is Flat on Planet Pluto. This is sort of an online live cosmic talk show about astronomy, science, and other stuff where the guests are clear, clearly the highlight and where you can ask any questions and also participate essentially using the chat right here. And the voice from beyond will essentially read your questions. Now, every Wednesday, we hope, at 5.30 p.m. we'll bring you a cosmic topic and amazing guests, just like today, who will share their passion for science and space. My name is David Sabral. I'm an astronomer and a, and a scientist. And just like all humans alive and that ever lived on this insignificant yet beautiful and unique planet, I'm mostly made of stars that died billions of years ago. It's about 90% of me, while the other roughly 10% for me and everyone else comes directly from the Big Bang and is more than 13.7 billion years old. And therefore, rich, poor, young, old, black, white, yellow, brown, men, women, regardless of our views, beliefs, or sexual orientation, we are all made of stars and cosmos. We're all made of the same cosmic material and we should all have the same rights and opportunities so we can also be unique and original in our own right, and specifically inspire others to continue to break boundaries, walls, and dream even higher. Now in this very first episode and the following, things can and will definitely go wrong. And I must stress that this is at the core of the scientific methods. Blowing things up and learning what happens is really important and that's also because when things work perfectly, we never really learn anything at all. Now, during June and July, I shall be your host as we attempt to bring you lots of astronomy, science, experiences, the human side of looking up, and also a lot of fully random, but hopefully fun stuff. So there will definitely be a lot of stuff and specifically cosmic stuff weekly. Now, in today's episode, we have even more public watching than in our first episodes, and you, we can really hear them. They're very loud out there. Now, if you're wondering, they are, of course, all wearing masks, respecting two meter social distancing rule and keeping quiet in awe of our amazing guests. And, and I mean the crickets, of course. Now, our guests tonight have been or will be studying in detail some of the gas giants of our solar system. So they're planets that, just like the Earth, are not flat, but unlike Pluto, are actual planets. Our guests will tell us more about the fascinating planets like Jupiter, Neptune, their moons, and some exciting discoveries about them. You can also ask questions, again, here, and participate in yet another round of crazy units. Now, actually teamed around the giants of the solar system, and I'm sure it'll be amazing, or, or not. Now, for now, uh, please welcome our guests, Andrew Jenkins, Carl Tender, and Greg Green. The public is Greg. How are you today? How are you all doing? And you need to unmute yourselves to contribute, yeah. as always. Doing well, David. Doing well. Keeping keeping nice and safe. And I've got a cup of tea, so all things are good here. That's good. Uh, I like the mug. Obviously, it's all mm -hmm. about the mug. George, all, all good. Mug, I'm ready and prepared. Oh, I feel very left out. I've only got a water bottle. Oh, <laughs> I'm not prepared enough. Call yourself a scientist. 
Oh, thank you so much for, for coming in, into the show. And because we're talking about gas giants, maybe we could start with uh, you know, the biggest one, uh, Jupiter. And, and I hear that uh, both uh, you, Charlie, and Andrew have been, have been studying it. So maybe, Charlie, could you start by telling us why, why we should care about Jupiter in our own solar system? I mean, to start off with, I mean, it's the biggest. So again, going to be most important. But is so different to our planet. There's so many different processes happening there. Um, the whole sort of way that it works is completely different to what we're used to here, here on Earth. So every single time that we find out something about Jupiter, it is often completely varied to what we know here. So that's really exciting. And yeah, there's so much that we don't know about it. So it's quite nice to have a bit of a blank canvas to go and start researching off. Now, Andrew, does, does Jupiter actually play uh, any important role in the solar system or is this like, it's just big and that's it, I mean? Uh, no, it does play some really important roles. In fact, uh, it kind of acts like a shield to the Earth occasionally. Uh, due to its incredibly large mass so far out in the solar system, it can occasionally take some of the asteroids that are heading Earth's way and either have it collide with the planet itself or deflect them away from us. So it acts sort of like a, a big cosmic shield occasionally. And the other thing is, do, do you know how many moons right now that we think Jupiter has? Because it keeps changing all the time. I believe it's 79, but I could be wrong. So it's, it's always a, a very big number. Um, mm. Most Charlie, do you have a, a better update? No, 79 is the number I've got. I'm not going to lie, I did look it up today. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, no I, it's, I focused on <laughs> one moon <laughs> for my entire project. Like, and we'll talk we'll talk about those those moons now george uh i guess for you maybe jupiter is a little bit too mainstream right i mean everyone studies it um so yeah, it's too better cool to for school. so what about um neptune so jupiter is the biggest of of the the gas giants neptune um is the smallest the is there smallest. anything that makes it more special um well apart from being really far away and i guess now the furthest planet away from us it's got a really volatile atmosphere which is compared to earth it's pretty crazy <laughs> do you have an, an idea of how long a year is in neptune in case people want to become younger and live there uh good luck it's 165 years <laughs> oh, that's good uh so I guess I guess it means that uh, all of us are under one year one years old in Neptune years, right? That's yeah, a, that's true. We're all very 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 young. And <laughs> what is it mostly made of, actually, uh, Neptune? So it's um, more it's cold and it's more methane and ammonia as opposed to oxygen and nitrogen for us. But I guess for the most most of the uh, the composition of the planet as a whole. It's kind of more like a star, right? More like Jupiter, I assume. It's mostly like hydrogen and helium, right? Yeah. So it, yeah, as a gas giant, it is more of more gas and light things than, let's say, Earth is rocky and nitrogen atmosphere. Whereas Neptune would be more hydrogen and helium and lighter elements. Yeah. So I mean, if if uh, something like Jupiter, that's that's quite big and mostly made of hydrogen and helium, uh, why don't we call it a star? I mean, it basically ticks all the boxes, right? What's the crucial thing? It is, well, it's not undergoing fusion. It's, that's the thing, it has, it's what it's made of, it's what it's composed of, but you're not getting that, you're not getting the fusion, you're not getting that output of heat, so you're not going to get, it's not doing the star's job. <laughs> and I guess, in terms of space exploration, and because I mean, Jupiter is pretty cool, um, Andrew, do you think we can ever kind of launch a rocket and attempt to, to land on it? Or are there any, any challenges? Uh, there's uh, quite a few challenges, I'd argue, to, to successfully landing on Jupiter. First of all being, there is no, well, I mean, there's a solid surface, but by the time you get down to that solid surface, the pressure alone would crush any spaceship that we try and put on on the surface and there's only a surface just because of how dense the gases have become so there isn't really anything to land on per se and if you did it would be destroyed so i get does it mean that um we can't really think about alien life uh in jupiter if we ever make it there <laughs> not really jupiter not. itself 
I'd go a pretty solid no. I, um, I'd be surprised. Yeah. So It'd are we be... out? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't think they could, but it would not be anything like we were expecting, I don't think. So we're, we're, I was just saying that we're placing bets just in case in the future, you know, people discover <laughs> some weird life forms, um, you might have to pay up. Uh, <laughs> So the other thing that I was going to ask is whether uh, people, the you know, so many people out there, whether there there's any questions uh, so far. I assume no. Maybe the voice from beyond can confirm. Not really, David. Not really. Okay. So our guests are clearing everything up and letting people know about the the gas giants. And so maybe before we talk about. Um, the prospects of life that will probably involve the moons of the gas giants, right? So not really the gas giants themselves. Uh, and to eat things up and to involve people that are watching, I think it might be a, a good opportunity uh, for our uh, famous feature of the show, which is Crazy Units, um, which is uh, an amazing tribute to how badly units are in astronomy. Uh, but making it them even worse. Right? So if you've watched the, the Zero Show, uh, you might have practiced measuring distances with toilet rolls. They come a handy. Uh, it's, a, it's a unit. Andrew, you have experience? I, I do have experience. I, I got both of them right the last time I played, but that really was by guessing <laughs> rather than knowing. And the other skill, of course, is measuring things in, in yards. So yards and toilet rolls, uh, yeah. Things have come come out. So today we're going to be looking at also units of volume uh, to do with the gas giants. I mean, they're big, right? They occupy a lot of volume. Uh, so for those of you that have seen this before, uh, our super high tech way of sharing is now. <laughs> and uh, of course, the system has uh, uh, asked me to restart the system for three times. Which is nice. Yeah, this is why you want, right? When you're mm -hmm. when you're live on YouTube. Always. So the question is. Ah, <laughs> what is the volume of Neptune in teacups, right? That's kind of the proper, proper units to measure volumes of planets. And you have four options. So option A being uh, three sextillion teacups. And this is obviously like a proper brew, right? So that, that matters. Option B is 40 quintillion teacups. Option C, 210 septillion teacups or option D, 70 trillion teacups. Now, I guess Andrew, Andrew is, uh, is looking very confident, at least he's on, not. The, <laughs> on the way he's thinking. So. I was looking at this and going, how much is that? <laughs> yeah. I feel very disadvantaged now without a cup mm. in front of me. How much is it? What, a cup of tea volume? 250. 250, 300, really? something like that. Yeah, so right. basically divide it by four to get back to a sensible, mm. well, yeah. Mm. yeah, sensible unit by four. Fortunately, I haven't got a clue what the volume of Neptune is. <laughs> it's so big, it's a, it's a giant. I, so. I'm assuming What's it's three, yeah. radius, not as... Like. Yeah, I don't even know the radius. I know nothing about Neptune. I, I hate to it's I hate to say. Quite George? a fair bit smaller than... Yeah. Jupiter. Yeah. Jupiter. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I, I don't know the mass of Jupiter, but that's we'll ignore that fact. Uh, Andrew, do you wanna you wanna go for a just go for an option, just like go with the flow? Yeah. Uh, let's. Oh no. Uh, I'll go for B. Forty quintillion, because to the eighteen, that's yeah, sort of in the middle of all those numbers again, ish. Sounds about okay. Yeah, that's a good enough reason. It actually, mm -hmm. is in the middle. Of that range, Charlie. Do you wanna? Do you wanna? I'm gonna that? go for an A, a solid A. I a think it's a big A, definitely. Okay. So you'll get you'll get yellow. George, you're the expert. Well, <laughs> considerably, relatively, you're the expert in Neptune. Yeah, I googled Neptune this morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, I mean, this is this is how science is done. You use Google. The correct and, answer uh, is actually one. The pro for a proper brew. The volume of one proper <laughs> brew is one Neptune volume. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, you drink a lot of tea, I can tell. Yep. <laughs> so A, B, C, or D? Uh, C. 
see. Hell no. Okay. Oh, you got the same color. Let me just make sure I change that. Right. So I guess if it's D, you all got it wrong. Yeah. What about uh, the millions of people watching at home? Uh, do you have any guesses so far? Yes, we have several guesses. We have okay. A from João, B from Mamaya, Heather C, Adam A. So several options. No D, I guess. No D. So people are very confident that it's uh, definitely not D. So they agree with you. It uh, might be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, <laughs> no idea. Public uh, votes always go well. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we've discussed it already that uh, Neptune is, is the smallest of the gas giants, right? But it's still pretty big. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the volume is still quite big. And in uh, more normal units, this would be 6.3 times 10 to the 13 cubic kilometers. So, in other ways, I guess um, if you were to use um, the volume of the Earth, there's about, you could fit about 60 planet Earths. And obviously the Earth is not flat, otherwise it would be many more than, than 60. It's very round. And uh, in my calculations, uh, I consider that a proper brew is approximately 0 0.3 liters. See, yeah. Found it, right? That's, that's a proper That's fair. Yeah. yeah. So that means you can actually pour about 2.1 times 10 to the 26, or actually 210 septillion uh, teacups. And I meant to say it is correct. So George, well done. See, you're Perfect. the expert. <laughs> you're the expert. So C is indeed the correct answer. So well done to those that uh, were able to get it right at home. Who, who got it? Uh, Voice of Beyond? So uh, the right question is, are you right? The right answer is C, 210. Uh, sorry, <laughs> was Heather. Heather was the one that got it right. Well done, see, this is this is why you get when you study galaxies, you, you become an expert also in, the, in Neptunes. Uh, now, <clears throat> the next question that we have uh, will not be about Neptune, but about uh, Jupiter. Yay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I won't do Yay. any better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so just for your information, um, Jupiter right now is 22 billion toilet rolls away from us. Andrew, just so just so you don't mind. I'll write, I'll write that down. Yeah, 22 billion toilet rails away. I actually know. Uh, so it's not, not super relevant for the question, uh, but it makes it fun. So I'm just going to add to it. Uh, the question is actually about the mass of Jupiter's moon oh. Io, right? But in this amazing uh, units, apparently, which are Dutch casks. That, um, I have to Google what that is as well. Yeah, what, what is yeah. that? What's a Dutch so, cask? just this is public information. This is public service. A Dutch cask is apparently a UK unit of weight or mass for butter and cheese. I love right? it. So if you think that the moon is made of cheese, I mean, why not Io? Um, so um, I thought it was pretty relevant. It, I mean, it has some, some potential. So the potential answers are A, 1.2 septillion Dutch casks, so that's 10 to the 24. 1.8 sextillion Dutch casks, that's 10 to the 21. Option C, 1.9 trillion Dutch casks, 10 to the 12. Or option D, 1.5 million Dutch casks, 10 to the 6. Andrew. I wish I knew how much a Dutch cask weighed. Because <laughs> this, this would make it a lot easier. I don't know what the mass of Io is either. I can tell you how much per second it loses. Yeah, which is a, a classic. It's a, it's, it's a classic. You throw that into your literature review and your thesis. It's a ton a second of mass mm -hmm. it loses, which is a startlingly large amount of mass. But then on its own scale, it's, it's not too bad. So... Oh, I don't know. I'm just going to go... F I'm assuming a Dutch cask isn't actually that much. If it's I mean, maybe butter. maybe it was like what they used to transport, butter and cheese. Yeah, I almost definitely. And butter and cheese, if they was to transport, although it'd be large, it's, it's not going to be phenomenally large. I'm just going to go for C. Okay. 
see. see now I don't know which one to guess because I was also going to guess two, but I feel like I have to go somewhere different now. Okay. Uh, yeah, could, we could join in. Up. The two Jupiter people. We can, yeah, we can I'm pretend. Feeling, I feel like C is a solid answer. Uh, well, uh, we'll... Because I did Google how much a Dutch cast this cast. Oh, I can't cheating, say it. Cheating, cheating. That is definitely <laughs> cheating. Well, <laughs> some of us just like to be more informed before making a guess. It's... Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> we like to assess our options. Um. Yeah, I, oh, I don't know. I'm gonna go, oh, I'm gonna go solid on a C, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we can fail together. It, uh, it's becoming a popular option for people that study, I guess, Hyo and Jupiter. What about you, George? Um, what do you think? I'm gonna go with C as well. C Ooh. as well. Oh, wow. This is where we're all wrong and just look yeah, really stupid. Oh, yeah, it's likely. Great team effort, guys. <laughs> It's, uh, it's very interesting to have such a clear majority. What about uh, people, well, the billions of people watching us or trillions of people watching us, uh, what are they saying? They're saying that they think the B option is the most B? likely to be correct. Okay, and are there other, other options? Yes, there's some A, when Paul say it's C. Okay. Well, Lots no of D. people say it's B, no, no D. Okay. Okay, All right, so I guess some people agree with you, uh, but apparently it was B at least, uh, maybe a slight majority towards B, uh, but I guess with you guys, it's, it's probably very, very easy. Now, a dust cask is defined as a kind of a measure of weight or mass, uh, corresponds to 112 pounds. That's 51 <laughs> kilograms, which Charlie like knows that. because she Googled it's it. So Cheese. That's, yeah. a, that's a lot. There's a so yeah. much cheese. Yeah. So this is the this is a Dutch cask. Um, and so the correct answer is actually B. Oh, for goodness sakes. B is the correct answer. All right. So there's 1.8 sextillion Dutch casks in IO. And and I guess in literature reviews, one thing you should definitely add is mm. uh, mm -hmm. how many Dutch casks it's losing per second, because that's I think this is what we need. Um, I, I think so. it will really spice up any future paper. Yeah, I think <laughs> I, I, I would I would say that. And it definitely would it be flagged up by the plagiarism checker if you ever wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> so IO is, is actually Jupiter one, so it's the innermost and I guess third largest of the four Galilean moons apparently. Uh, and has a, a mass of about nine yeah. times 10 to the 22 kilograms. Yeah. So this is right. the reason why in, more in Dutch casks, um, the mass is 1.8 times 10 to the 21. So that's definitely a lot of butter and cheese. Uh, yeah, do not eat IO. I think that's, uh, that's the important message. No. Uh, you can't tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, have a good go at it. <laughs> It's a lot of oxygen in N2, but... <laughs> well done to those that got um, B and got it correctly. And because we're now talking about IO, um, mm. it's, uh, it's probably good to talk about the, the, the moons of these giant planets in general, right? Um, because they're quite interesting. So maybe we could start talking about IO. And I mean, why is it sending matter to outer space? Is, is it just like there's too much? So it, it just it's losing it, or is there some physical reason why that's happening? And Charlie, go for it. Yeah. Um. So, um, because Io orbits so close to Jupiter, it's um gravitationally um distorted by um Jupiter's massive gravitational field, um, which actually causes it to be volcanic, and it makes it the most volcanic body in the entire solar system. Um. So all these volcanic eruptions that are constantly happening spew out all this material and then that is that's why it re releases so much material so Andrew did you wanna do you wanna add anything to Io from um, what you've learned about it or studied I mean uh, Charlie perfectly uh, summed that up there yeah it is, it is the the effect of Ju uh, of Jupiter's incredibly large mass on on this quite Relatively small body that uh, has that causes this volcanic eruption and the great volcanic eruption. As we said earlier, it's about a ton of mass per second gets emitted from Io, and that then forms a torus, so a donut of plasma around Jupiter. 
uh, it's actually quite a dense torus uh, that gets confined to the equator by the spin of Jupiter as well. What about Neptune, George? Does it have any, any kind of natural satellite that can compete with Jupiter? Yeah, so the one my project is going to be on is Triton. And it's a really big moon compared to the other ones in the Neptunian system. It takes up 99% of the mass, more than. And is there any, any cool feature about it? Um, I mean, can it compete with Io or not really? I mean, I think it can. I think I'm legally obliged to say it does. Um, <laughs> You've yeah, signed so A sort of interesting part of it is the amount of water, of water ice on Triton is a bit, we, we're not too sure exactly how much there is. And what about, I mean, the other moons of Jupiter? Um, and I guess uh, specifically, there's things that people hear about like uh, Europa and the prospects of like uh, finding life underneath. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think we're, we're going to do it and it's something there um, or not really? Charlie, it, it looks like you have an opinion. I like to be optimistic. I think if, if you're going to, if you're going to find one, it could be, I think Europa is our best bet. There's a lot of interesting sort of properties about it but the unfortunately we don't know that much about it so there's all these like really cool theories uh, about how life could be sustained basically modeling it on things on earth but whether we how positive we think they'll actually come out is up to up to i think your positivity on on the planet <laughs> on the moon do you know of any any kind of currently planned missions to to try to kind of go to the surface and dig in and Andrew? Not off the top of my head. I remember there was talk about it at one point, but I, I, I'm definitely not sure. Yeah, so hopefully, I guess, Europe um, either takes the lead. Charlie, do you know of any? I think isn't Juice one, which is Jupiter's something icy moons. It's very badly, it's a typical <laughs> bad acronym. Oh, it's um, all and they pluck juice out of it because it's Jew ice. Um, and I think that's planned for like 2020 something, but as usual, it'll probably get pushed back quite a lot. Yeah. But I think that's it's I think it's one of the next ESA ones going out, actually. Yeah, they're almost always delayed. Mm -hmm. And I guess we surprisingly we do have questions from uh, YouTube from uh, our uh, 1.5 viewers that are currently <laughs> there. Um, Voice from Beyond, do you wanna do you wanna tell us what the question is? Yes. So what is your opinion? on the most likely objects to hold life in the solar system? Uh, so I would I, say sorry. before Andrew goes, I would say the planet Earth. Yeah, got it. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Cheeky G. <laughs> I was, oh, I was going to be so smart there. Uh, no, uh, so it would probably be anything with liquid water. Uh, we know of icy planets, uh, sorry, icy moons, and there's suspicion that some of these icy moons have liquid, uh, fully liquid layers on them as well. Uh, any liquid pools on other planets that we believe exist, like under Mars, that, that we think there's actually running water still, that's where we believe we may find life, uh, if we're lucky. George, do you, wanna, do you think uh, Neptune or something around it has, has any possibility or not really? Uh, well, its moons are m mostly icy nitrogen and water ice. So I would say if there, if life was going to be somewhere, it would be on a, on somewhere which has water. Yeah. Charlie. Um... I mean, to not sound like a broken record, I I agree. Water is definitely. <laughs> um possibly oxygen but then you do get even on earth um a lot of like um there's some extremophiles that don't need oxygen so you could possibly even not discount that as well i mean obviously one of, one of the big problems is um it's fine to have water but water is everywhere uh, and you you need it kind of to be in liquid form right yeah but because these things are so far out um i mean on the surface it'll just be ice and so how can we even get liquid water um on on these moons um, so this, like in the same way that Io is like volcanically affected um, with the larger moons um, that can happen to a lesser extent. So on Europa, it gets gravitationally tidally disrupted causing sort of these like this like swelling and movement of the planet and that can cause 
heating from within, um, leading to this like layer of liquid water at Europa. I presume possibly similar for you, at Neptune, George? Yeah, so as I was saying with Triton being so big, um, it was difficult to figure out where Triton actually came from because it has a, we a weirdish orbit. Um, and they thought maybe it could have come from a binary pair of orbiting blobs, let's say. Um, and that caused a lot of tidal disruption, which would make you know, liquid water a thing. So there is there are some prospects and I guess it's all about exploring it. Um, so the other thing that would be really cool to talk about is you kind of already mentioned, or at least some of the, um, the things that give rise to it is that these gas giants are also super cool because of their strong magnetic fields, right? Kind of space weather happens around mm -hmm. them and they produce some fascinating phenomena, right? So I guess the question to Andrew, are, are auroras in Jupiter prettier than on Earth? And is it worth the trip? Uh, if you were to somehow manage to get yourself on a rocket and, and shoot your way off to Jupiter and be like, I'll get to see the aurora, unfortunately, you wouldn't see anything. They are, the aurora aren't in the visible spectrum. I believe it's ultraviolet. So they are there and they are massive and they are very pretty, but not to us. So basically they're, they're emitting at the wavelength of, I think it's like 12, 16 Armstrong, so Lyman Alpha. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> basically they're Lyman Alpha emitters. That's, that's yeah. what space science is about, studying uh, Lyman Alpha emitters. Uh, but I mean, uh, is the cause of, of uh, these auroras the same as on Earth or, or not really? Uh, I don't want to take too much away from Charlie here because I know that she loves, loves this stuff. Charlie, go for it. Um, Explain so to us. Yeah, no, then they're, they're really quite different, actually. So at Earth, all the aurora is sort of driven by the sun. Um, all the like the uh, material is um, emitted by the sun. Um, how strong, how uh, bright all the auroras are is pretty much controlled by the sun. Whilst at Jupiter, it doesn't really care about the sun. No. Uh, we don't really even know if it has a noticeable, that much of a noticeable effect on the aurora. Everything's to do with Io. All the material really comes from Io. That ton per second is a, producing this huge plasma torus, um, and how all the plasma gets into the atmosphere um, is all to do with that plasma and how it rotates, which is back onto Andrew's <laughs> favorite <Yes>. topic. <laughs> <laughs> this is what a lot of my uh, uh, thesis was on. So you have all this plasma orbiting uh, around Jupiter, and as that plasma moves radially outwards, it has to slow down to conserve angular momentum. But when that happens, it starts lagging behind co-rotation. And that really doesn't want to happen. It causes uh, bending of magnetic field lines, which drives currents. And it basically, we're trying to push it back towards co-rotation. Uh, and in doing so, you end up having information be transferred between the planet and that plasma, going backwards and forwards. And that, and that transfer can drag some plasma uh, up towards the poles. And that's how we get these bright aurora. So actually, there's a... a, a and you also get these acceleration regions due to it as well, which can further accelerate plasma down towards the planet. So actually the Io has a footprint left on Jupiter as an aurora. So you can see where it has been. It has basically the footprint of the planet itself and a little tail from as it pushes through its own plasma, it disrupts it causing uh, the bending of magnetic fields lines, which then gives rise to uh, a large number of acceleration regions that then pushes plasma to come down and rain upon Jupiter. And I guess, is this a feature of just Jupiter? Does, does Neptune, is Neptune competing in space tourism with like uh, trying to provide uh, even more beautiful auroras or not really? Uh, Neptune's aurora is mostly B type, which is like, is similar to the stable auroral red arc on Earth, which just basically means it's sort of red. Um, and they are mostly caused by Triton, similar to what Andrew and Charlie have just said, because it's so far away from us. And what about Saturn? Is it is it always also the same thing uh, that any auroras are caused by uh, one of the satellites? I think Saturn's actually more like Earth. Okay. So again, back to sort of solar wind, because I don't. It, yeah, I think that's its main driver. Um, I'm not a hundred percent so. Yeah. So the Earth is not completely unique in having auroras driven by the sun, I guess. No, I think it's, yeah, I think like Mars is the same. It has very, very weak aurora, but yeah, everyone sort of apart from Jupiter 
Neptune are driven by the sun. So I think we do have a few questions uh, from YouTube. One, I guess, related with um, some crazy units, um, because we're not talking about uh, Mercury. But um, in case you do want to answer this question, it's very relevant. Um, it's to do with, um, I guess, how many office chairs it takes to cover Mercury. <laughs> Uh, I mean, is that height, width, over like looking down? It, Heather, you need to be more specific. <laughs> exactly. None of this. Is, what sort of office chair is it? Is it from Ikea or is it one of those really nice fancy ones? Yeah, we're not going to answer this question until you take it seriously. Come on now. This is a serious show. <laughs> so Voice from Beyond, can you, can you tell us uh, the other question that we have? Yeah, the question is, when was Earth first proven to move? scientifically or otherwise mm, to move that is a is a very good question um i would say that from an experimental point of view uh as i guess when when we went to space that uh just finished it off um i don't know if you know of any famous experiments to show that um i don't know i know like because I know Jupiter's involved with like the heliocentric model, but I don't know, like, that was sort of when we proved that it was no longer everything revolving around us. Um, so because Jupiter's orbits are different, it goes in retrograde. So then from that, you can work out that it can't be the Earth at the centre. Um, so I guess you could say that, but... Indirectly, know. yeah. Um, mm. yeah. But I guess directly, there's nothing like going to space and looking down. <laughs> um, yeah. And we, we can now have even webcams just pointing down and streaming live instead of streaming this the Earth is flat on planet Pluto. Uh, so do we have any any further questions? Not really. We had one related to life, which is what characteristics would you hold as the most important for these planets to hold life? That's a very good question and deserves a very good answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think I'm able to give it at this time. Um, fundamentally, you want to, I believe, although I'm definitely not a biologist, you want to build amino acids to, to get a lot of life that we understand. Mm -hmm. What the constituent components of that are has gone, but I believe that nitrogen is really important. <laughs> nitrogen, oh, oh, <laughs> long time. Um, yeah, because I think, Oh, I don't know. Europa's, they've like, I've been able to identify some like long chain proteins and things, but they're not really sure how they got there. And they definitely don't think they're like biological, I think. So yeah, they don't really know how they make them on Europa compared to Earth. I mean, obviously the, the elephant in the room is we have no idea how life um, started here on Earth. And I guess from a, a very blunt scientific point of view, life is fake news because we've never produced it in a lab, right? So no one has ever conducted an experiment yet that, um, that can do it, right? From non-living matter to living. So if life is there, it can kind of you know, propagate, but uh, mm -hmm. if it's not, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a challenge. And I'm sure if someone does it, they will get a Nobel prize, but also get in trouble ethically because- Yeah. <laughs> yeah creating life. Now, uh, the other thing that I wanted to know is um, a little bit more about yourselves, right? Um, so I think because we're talking about planets and uh, I know you're paid to say, George, that uh, Neptune's the best planet ever and Andrew and Charlie that it's Jupiter, but uh, really um, what are your favorite planets? I mean, Charlie, what is your favorite planet without um, like uh, contractual obligations? Mm. Yeah, correct. Oh. I mean, don't say Pluto. Oh god no! I mean, good name, but I can't give it anything more than that. I mean, I have to be true to brand. I do love a bit of Jupiter, mainly because of how pretty it is. I'm not going to go anything scientific. I just like all the swirly patterns in it. George, um... I've got a story to go with mine. So my favourite planet is Venus, Venus, and it's it's because my dad and I took the telescope up the road to do some early morning observing, and we got in trouble with the police. <laughs> So we had to show them Venus through the telescope to prove we weren't, I don't what, know. What, what we do they think doing, you but... were doing? 
I don't know. <laughs> that will stick with me for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, Venus is pretty cool, um, and it, it drains acid, right? So, uh, but apart from that, it's pretty cool. It's like the Earth, but yeah. <laughs> Andrew. Uh, I, I love Venus, uh, mostly because it is the only planet named after a woman, Aphrodite. Uh, it's the, the good version to the Greek myths, and I, I'm a big fan of Greek myths. But sadly, we have the Roman names, which I don't think are any, anywhere near as cool. Jupiter, why can't we call it Zeus? How <laughs> awesome would that be? You, you can. I mean, there's... I, mean, there's I can, but it's, it's just not... Everyone will look at me quite weirdly. Well, more so than usual. I mean, discover a planet, you can call it whatever you want them. Ah, that's true. You may be challenged because the IAU has all these standards, but uh, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, I will call it Zeus. Well, <laughs> Aphrodite is way more interesting. So the other, the other question that's important is what is, what are your, or what is your favorite moon? And again, uh, outside your contractual obligations of saying IO, for example, Andrew. Uh, I think I have to go with Sharon because that's my mom's name and I've always really enjoyed it. The spelling is massively off, but otherwise I really love that one. And George? Um, I like our moon. It's a classic, you know, it'll always be there. Often <laughs> when it's not. But, you know, <laughs> until it isn't, it'll always be there. It is drifting away slowly. <laughs> Charlie? I don't like that because I have all the boring typical answers of what I should be having for my... So I, lo I love Io because I also really like volcanoes. So the fact that it's just a planet full of volcanoes, you can't really get better than a moon full of... A, moon full of volcanoes you can't really get better than that so it was not promoted live it's still it's still a satellite it's good yeah uh, <laughs> so the the other thing that i was going to ask is uh, if, if, is like um when you were a child uh, was this something you were dreaming of of like studying um the gas giants and their moons um were you always fascinated with these or were you like um, fascinated with other astro things when you were little charlie um, yeah, I definitely never really considered the gas giants. I only got onto them because I'm really like the atmosphere and realized that I could also do it for other planets and they have more interesting ones than ours. Um, and you can learn a lot more, like there are a lot more to find out about them. So it's quite more of a, quite a recent thing for me wanting to study the gas giants. And George, so, um, is there a reason? So you're not studying Venus, right? So why why Neptune? Um, was it something um, you were fascinated about? No, I mean it was the uh, the project caught my eye more because of the water thing than which planet it was. Um, no, as a kid, I was fascinated with Star Trek. So any planet really <laughs> was. <laughs> Andrew, what about you? Um, I, similarly, I I chose the project sort of. First, uh, I, uh, so I fell into that one more than choosing Jupiter straight out because I was interested in the option to do all the modeling I did there and looking into how information was transferred, I thought was more interesting uh, than, but my fascination, I think lies with stars more than anything else. I, I love the, the life cycle of a star and the different classifications. I find that really interesting. And, and I guess uh, one of the final questions that I have for you is imagine that you have an infinite budget to, to, for a space mission. And now it start with Andrew. Um, what would you do with it? Where would you send the spacecraft and, and to try to do what? Um, it would be nice to have some more data about Jupiter. Uh, I mean, we have got a new probe there. We've got Juno slowly collecting more data. I think some of the other planets, though, are a lot more uh, unfortunate about how much data they've received. Uh, I believe, oh, I can't, which planet's off my head? I think has just one data point. <laughs> Someone's ice giants. <laughs> yes. So maybe I would ask for, for them to, to have uh, a, a nice probe, but realistically, I love uh, space exploration uh, and human settlements. So I would be very interested in making some sort of moon base uh, as a launching point for further missions, uh, further afield, and basically using it as like a refueling station and a, and a base, which I believe is what NASA is currently looking into doing. And would you actually go on a mission? Absolutely not. Space is terrifying. <laughs> Good answer. Well, so, what about you, George? Uh, where would you go and, and would you actually go on a mission or would, would you just send people or machines on it? I would absolutely go on a mission. That would be great fun. <laughs> um, I think probably Europa. Um, a bit boring, I know, but it needs to be done. <laughs> we got to find out. Very mainstream. 
Yeah. Charlie, are, would you risk going on a mission and where would you go? Oh, I would, um, I could definitely not go on one of the one way missions. No way, absolutely not. Like going to like colonize Mars would be my idea of hell. Um, but something where you maybe like a little trip to the moon, a little quick trip, see a bit there, <laughs> have a bit of a bounce, collect some samples. That could be quite interesting. Um, I mean, I'd obviously love to see Jupiter, but I don't fancy a 12 year round trip. So I'm not that bothered about going out, um, but it'd be quite cool to, I would love to see the, the storms and the like bands of Jupiter, which makes it my favorite planet. That would be really interesting. So one final question I have for, for you guys is um, if younger people are watching live or in the very distant future, uh, do you have any any kind of key message for them? I, I don't know. If I could tell them, for example, you know, don't study planets and study galaxies instead. That's what I'd say. But uh, what would you <laughs> what would you say? No, I, I love planets as well. Don't worry, Charlie. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, yeah, don't think that you know everything before you've decided what you want to do because there's so much about every anything that you don't know that you don't know yet. And I never would have guessed I'd be doing atmospheres on a different planet when you came to me in first year or before that. George, um, what would you say? Um, I'd say don't dismiss your passing interests. Like something you think is just a, a casual interest or a hobby or a TV show you like, it could turn into the rest of your life if you wanted it to. That's really good. Andrew? Uh, mine, I think would be be curious. Uh, if you like something, look into it. Uh, even just never have too much pressure on yourself. If you, if you just sort of occasionally look at things when you when you have time or when you're interested, that's enough to sort of generally get more knowledge about things. And the more you know about lots of different topics, the more you know what you could go into in the future. So yeah, be curious. That's good. So do we have any final questions from uh, from YouTube? Or are people completely clear of where to find life, which planets to study more, and which we don't need to study more? <laughs> No questions? No. Then uh, I guess uh, that's that will be all for, for today. So uh, thank you again so much, uh, George, Charlie, Andrew. It was really brilliant to, to have you here. Um, so we'll have a last round of applause. And, and people are not, they're not very noisy, but uh, they're not the fact. <laughs> So thanks to, to everyone, the, um, essentially the 1.5 people watching at home uh, who watched and participated. Well done to those that got the questions right. Uh, also well done to those that got it wrong because the questions were not easy at all. Uh, I, would, I would not have gotten them correctly if I didn't make them myself. So we will be back uh, hopefully next week um, with uh, the same or different technical problems. Uh, we love technical problems uh, like the microphone stopping. Uh, the middle of the, the show and until then um, I guess I would say everyone should all be really nice to each other and keep dreaming and don't forget to look up and uh, I guess in a similar message to our guests uh, just consider your curiosity and if you if you have something you're fascinated about I think it's always worth exploring and learning more so uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week so. Off of mission 41B, the first flight of the orbiter Discovery, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Welcome home, Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful. You'll have to take it up the hangar, Joe. We're going to dust it off first. Three, two, one, zero, zero, zero. and liftoff. Liftoff. Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. Oh,